if you have not gotten one of these little containers, which is all self-contained, has the wafer and the juice in it, then there are still a basket in the back. Kale, can you uh, hit numbers 13 and 14 there, just so we can get the front, yeah, lit up for the recording. All right, hopefully they'll go on shortly. I don't know. Oh, yeah, well, if they don't go on, then maybe they're not plugged in. They, they weren't plugged in either. Okay, so let's get those plugged in over here. That one went on. Okay. Yeah, hopefully that'll go on now. There it goes. So if you haven't gotten one of these, go ahead and uh, you can grab that from the back. But we're going to be in Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 39 through 45. And as I said, we're going to be doing a little detour called Christmas carols, where we get to look at several of these little songs and exclamations of joy. And the first is that uttered by Elizabeth. And I, I love this as she recognizes the faith of Mary, which was tremendous. Mary is such an amazing woman in Scripture, as well as the blessing that is coming through her womb. And we're going to focus on that in a moment. But before we dive into the text, I want to just give us a little bit of background because it is helpful to understand the beginning few verses previous to this as it sets the stage. So Luke, of course, is writing the account of Christ's birth. But before he gets into the account of Christ's birth, he focuses on the miraculous conception of his distant cousin, John the Baptist. John the Baptist is the son of Elizabeth and Zacharias. And that all takes place in the text a few verses beforehand. And if you read um, Zechariah, he is a priest, and while he is in the temple ministering, the angel Gabriel appears to him and tells him that he's going to have a son who is going to be filled with the Spirit, and he's going to proclaim the Messiah. He's going to make the path of the Lord known to the people. And Zechariah doesn't believe him. And Zechariah is shocked and filled with surprise over this, so much so that, of course, the angel says, okay, fine, you can't speak until this comes to pass. And, of course, uh, his wife, Elizabeth, she conceives, and six months after she has conceived, roughly, the angel Gabriel appears to Elizabeth's relative. Now, we don't know exactly, maybe it's like a third cousin twice removed or something like that. We don't know exactly what Mary is to Elizabeth. The text just says relative in uh, verse 36. You can see that um, where it says, and behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age. You see the angel Gabriel confirms his teach his, his news to Mary that she is going to bear the Son of God, the Savior of the world, by saying that your relative Elizabeth is already with child about six months. And Mary, in perhaps one of the most amazing statements of faith in all of Scripture, verse 38 says, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Wow, that's pretty amazing that a young woman, likely 12 to 14 years old, would be able to hear that she's going to have a child, the child of God, even though she was a virgin, when she knew all of the ridicule and all of everything that would come with that, and she said, let it be done to me, for I am the servant of the Lord. That's 
pretty incredible, amazing faith. Praise God for the faith that Mary had. And so having heard this news about her relative, Elizabeth, and trusting in the angel, but maybe wanting to uh, confirm what the angel is saying, Mary arises and goes to the hill country in Judah. And so she goes immediately, now we're into our text today, and she goes and enters the house of Zechariah and Elizabeth. So again, get the, get the progression of the story here as we go. And it says that when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. Now, who's that baby? We just said that baby's name is John the Baptist. That is John the Baptist in utero, and he is already proclaiming, he is already prophesying, he is already doing the job that he was made to do in his mother's womb. Isn't that cool? Like, the very first prophecy from John was in utero. And in fact, go back to verse 15. And the angel Gabriel said that this was going to happen, right? He said that, for he will be great before the Lord. This is talking about John the Baptist. And he must not drink wine or strong drink. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, where? Even from his mother's womb. Well, we see that. In his mother's womb, he is leaping for joy at the hearing of Mary's voice. And so Elizabeth now, filled with the Holy Spirit. So we see Elizabeth filled with the Holy Spirit. We see John filled with the Holy Spirit. And what, what do both of them do? Both of them, filled with the Holy Spirit, they make a proclamation. Both of them proclaim the Lord. And as we have been studying in our sermon series to the end of the earth in the book of Acts, every time you see the people of God filled with the Spirit of God, what is the result? A proclamation of the gospel. They are always moved to share the good news, to recognize how amazing and awesome and glorious our God is. And this is exactly what both little in utero John the Baptist and what Elizabeth do. She exclaims with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. She is glorifying Christ right then and there. She is proclaiming, making a proclamation of the good news that there would be blessing through the womb of Mary. Now, there's a couple of Greek words in here that I find interesting, and I just want to let you guys know what they are. Maybe you can write little notes in your text, just because it helps to give a little bit more understanding of what exactly is going on here. And the first word that I want you guys to get is the Greek word for blessed or blessed. It appears three times here. Blessed are you among women. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. Two times in verse 42. And then again down in 45. Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Now in the Greek this word means to offer favor to someone or something. I am blessing you. I am offering favor to you. But the cool part is that in the Greek, this word was almost always used of someone from the upper class. It was a blessing or a, a favor that is being offered to someone of high standing in that community, in that culture. Now we know from the Gospels that neither Mary nor Joseph were of high standing. 
They were both of a lower class in Galilee. So the fact that Elizabeth is offering this kind of blessing to Mary is a big deal. She is immediately recognizing that the Lord is favoring her as if she is of the highest standing of persons. Why? For two reasons. And she says it right here. For her faith that she had, and because she is, has been chosen to be the bearer of God's Son, of Jesus Christ. And so because of those two things, she is tremendously blessed. She is of the highest standing before God. And that's something that is really important for us to have that perspective on in terms of God's blessing. Because it's very easy, isn't it, to get sucked in to the standards and the blessings of our world. And what the world says is what gives you blessing, what gives you reputation, fame. And God's standard of blessing, his matrix of evaluation for who has high standing is way different than the world, isn't it? And we see that here in operation. And so by God's grace, we are to be people who have the spiritual eyes to see how the Lord is moving and how he is blessing those around us, regardless of what the world may say, and to have the same sort of spiritual eyes with regard to the blessing in our lives. Because the truth is, to those who are part of the family of God, if we are more concerned about our standing in the world than we are about our standing before God, if we are more concerned about the blessing the favor we receive from the world rather than that, that which we receive from our God, we will never be like Mary. We will never be people who can say, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Because we will be distracted by all of the stuff going on around us and our hearts and our minds will go after those things rather than faithfully serving the Lord. And praise God that Mary continued to seek the Lord and was a fit vessel to receive that blessing. Amen? But it wasn't just because of her faith. It was also, and most importantly, because of the one whom she carried, that she was blessed. And that is Jesus. And that is what we are going to celebrate here in just a moment as we look to the Lord's Supper. But the second Greek word that I want us to understand here is the word Lord. And that is in verse 33. When Elizabeth says, And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? In the Greek, that is the word for master. And it is the same word in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, so remember, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew primarily, but it was translated from Hebrew into Greek, and that is called the Septuagint. The Greek translation of the Old Testament uses this word all throughout for Yahweh, for the covenantal name of God, the one who is and was and forever will be, the great I Am, right? Right? And so Elizabeth here, if we take her, the word that she is using, seems to be understanding that Mary is not just carrying any miraculous child. She is carrying the Son of God. She is carrying God himself. Now, there's no indication whatsoever in the text that Mary had told anyone that she was pregnant, that the angel Gabriel had appeared to her. In fact, the way that the text is written, 
it seems that she received the message from Gabriel and then went to go and find Elizabeth to confirm if what the angel Gabriel said to her was true about Elizabeth, that she was pregnant as well. And so it seems that somehow in here, Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, is aware that the Son of God is going to be born by Mary. And she recognizes him as her Lord, as her master, as her king. Which is a massive, massive deal when it comes to understanding what faith really is, right? This isn't just Elizabeth saying, oh yeah, I believe intellectually in the fact that you're going to have a baby. No, she is recognizing that the one who she, who Mary is carrying is the Messiah, is the promised Savior, is Master and Lord and King. And, and that is that same faith that Elizabeth is exercising is the same faith that Elizabeth blesses Mary for having. And that is the last Greek word I want to look at here. It is the word believed. Verse 45, And blessed is she who believed that there would be fulfillment, a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Now this Greek word here is the verb form of faith. But in English, we don't have any verb form of the word faith. We don't say that you, you, you really faithed that one, right? We change it into believe. You believed that one. That's how we render the verb form of faith. The problem is that to merely have intellectual assent falls short of what faith really is. See, in the Greek, faith is about trust and submission to something that leads to action. It's not just about saying, yeah, I believe that, and then walking away, and that belief never impacts or changes the way you live your life. It is a agreement with something that leads to you actually trusting, actually changing how you live, actually now having your life lived according to that thing which you have submitted to, which you have come under the authority of. That's what faith is. And that is what Mary had. How do we know that? Because she immediately got up and went and saw her cousin. She immediately began to put into action and to, to evaluate what the angel Gabriel said. And she was blessed because of it. And isn't it amazing that you have here in, these, in this story the amazing faith of Mary, a, a, a young girl, and she had that faith that you contrast that with who at the beginning of the story that we talked about? Zechariah, a righteous priest serving in the temple of God who had the same angel appear to him. And what happened with him? He did not have faith. He was not blessed the same way that Mary was. He had to see it first, to actually believe it, to trust in it. And I'm sure at some point prior to the birth of his son, when he saw his wife actually going through the stages of pregnancy, he probably trusted what the angel said. But by that point, it was he, he lost out, he missed out on the opportunity to walk in that particular form of blessing that comes from exercising faith when the Lord calls you to it. And it is. It is an opportunity to be blessed when the Lord puts you in a place where you can walk by faith, not by sight, like Scripture says. 
And praise God that Mary did that. And Elizabeth recognized it and, and pronounced the Lord's blessing upon her for that faith, for the son whom she carried. And so, before we go into our time of communion, I want to just leave us with a couple of thoughts that we can take away from this. Number one, I love the fact that John the Baptist's first action of prophecy was <laughs> from his mother's womb. And it was really a prophecy that was born out of what? Joy and excitement at the coming of the Savior of the world. And if you're anything like me, when we start to gear up for Christmas after Thanksgiving, and how it's been so commercialized and made into something that is not at all about the birth of our king, and especially this year when we're all wearing masks and everything is kind of, you know, dampened down. My encouragement to all of us is that we would ask the Lord to give us that same sort of joy and anticipation not just for the celebration of the birth of Christ, which is a wonderful, wonderful thing. We need to be celebrating that because that is a celebration of God's faithfulness, right? That's really what that is. It's a celebration of our God's faithfulness to send the answer to our brokenness, to our fallen world. He, he was faithful and sent that answer through Christ. And we can be so excited and joyful about that, that we get to celebrate that, right? Right? But it is also a foreshadowing of the fact that Jesus said that he was going to return. He is going to come back and he is going to fix once and for all the brokenness in this world. Amen? And that is something to be excited about. That is something to be filled with joy over because I don't know about you, when I look around and see all of the despair and discouragement and the debauchery and all the things in this world that are not what God desires for his people. I know that there is coming a day, hopefully sooner rather than later, Lord, come Lord Jesus, come, when we will be jumping for joy like John the Baptist did because Jesus is coming back. Amen? And that is the type of excitement and the type of, of, of joy that we are called to have as we look forward to that day. And, and so as we prepare for Christmas and the celebration of the faithfulness of our God and Him keeping His promises to send His Son, it is just another opportunity to be reminded that our King is coming again soon. And so it is... It is my challenge and encouragement to all of us that as we go through these next couple of weeks, let's ask the Lord to fill us with the joy of that truth, of that promise, of his not only faithfulness in the past, of the fact that we know he will be faithful in the future and his son will return. So ask the Lord to give us that joy, that excitement, that anticipation over the return of our king and over God's faithfulness. But secondly, ask the Lord, by God's grace, to help us to walk in the same degree of faith that Mary walked. I mean, it, it just a, she is such an amazing young woman here that she would be able to say what she did. And then to receive Elizabeth giving her the blessing because of the faith she exercised, a blessing that certainly the world would not have given to her. The world would have and did mock her and ridicule her about being pregnant before her marriage to Joseph. 
But God is no respecter of the standards of the world. And Mary exercised that faith, that trust, that submission to the truth of God that changed the way she lived. It impacted how she went about her life every single day. But you know what? Mary didn't do that by herself, did she? The first thing that the Lord did for Mary was to lead her to Elizabeth. And Elizabeth already knew. The Lord had already revealed to her that Mary was pregnant. And so the two of them together, immediately, in each of their miraculous pregnancies, Elizabeth, a woman far beyond childbearing years, and Mary, a young, young lady, not even married yet, both miraculously pregnant, had a community of faith together. They both could celebrate and worship their faithful God. And that is so, so important. You see, yes, Mary was blessed for her faith, but she immediately was brought into faith-filled community with her relative Elizabeth. And church, this time of year can be very lonely for lots of people, can't it? When we go through holidays and we don't have family sometimes around, and especially this year, we might not get to celebrate with family, with all of the mask stuff and all of the different quarantining we got going on. But praise God that we have each other. And if you don't have someone who you feel like you are have a community of faith with, then please reach out. We want to connect everyone here. We want to get you involved. We want to get you plugged in. We want you to find brothers and sisters who you can be encouraged by and who you can walk through this life with, because it's not easy, is it? But together, by God's grace, we can go forward. And that is exactly what Mary did with Elizabeth. They both went through the rest of their pregnancies together, praising God for his faithfulness, for his promises, because he was doing what he said he would do. He was sending the Messiah to save the world. And that's exactly what Jesus did. And that's what we are going to celebrate now. So if you would take out the juice and the wafer, the little container there. And we would invite you to participate in this with us. If you have put your faith and trust in Jesus, then let's celebrate this together. If you haven't, that's okay. Think about why you haven't. What is keeping you from that? And just respectfully keep the cracker and juice separated and put away. But for those who have put our faith in Christ, Jesus told us to joyfully remember what he has done, to celebrate his victory on the cross, to acknowledge his body that was broken and his blood that was shed. See, the birth of Christ is only significant because of the victory of Christ on the cross. The faith of Mary is only noteworthy because of what she placed her faith in. And that was in the word of God that the baby that she bore would be the savior of the world. And she trusted in that. And she was blessed. And that is what we are going to do right now tonight. We want to be joyful and excited that we get to celebrate the birth of our king, which ultimately is a celebration of the victorious death and resurrection of our king. And as Jesus said, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death, the Lord's victory until he comes.
comes. And that is the part that we can be most excited about, that he is coming again soon. Amen? So you can carefully pull back the first little tab on this to get to the wafer. I'm having a hard time here. There we go. Scripture says that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it after giving thanks. And he said that this is my body, which is broken for you. See, Jesus took all of the punishment that we deserve. He took it upon himself and had his body broken. So let's take a moment to just silently give thanks to our God that he was born so that he could be the one who bore the penalty for every single person on this planet. He bore the curse that we all deserve. Let's give thanks to our God for that. Lord Jesus, we thank you we praise you that you had your body broken for us. You took the shame of the cross, the curse of sin. Lord, you bore it all in your body, having your hands and feet pierced, the crown of thorns jammed upon your head, spat upon and mocked, Lord, you endured that because of your great love for us. You were born so that you could die. And we thank you and praise you for that obedience, Lord Jesus. And we thank you, Father, that you are faithful, that you made a way for us to have our punishment justly taken by your perfect and spotless son. And we remember that, Lord, together. Let's eat together. You can carefully pull back the second layer here. And Jesus not only had his body broken, but scripture is very clear that his blood was shed. His life was given. And we know that the word of God says that the only way that our sins can be forgiven, that we can be made right with the almighty, righteous, and just creator of the universe, is if we are without sin. But none of us are without sin on our own. Every single one of us messes up regularly. But by God's grace, Jesus Christ was perfect. He was without sin. He was the spotless lamb who could be slain for the sins of the world. Not just the punishment, the righteous wrath of God being poured out, but He poured out his life so that we could live. That is the significance of both his body being broken and his blood being shed. For it is through the shedding of his blood that we have that forgiveness and we can stand unashamedly before the Father pointing to the Son as the one who has covered us, who has 
made us white as snow and righteous to stand before the Father. That is what we remember. That is what we celebrate. And that is what should fill us with everlasting joy as we celebrate our Savior and King. Because of His death and resurrection to life, we can have full faith and confidence that through faith in Him, we too will live. So let's take a moment and give thanks to our Savior for His life that was poured out for us. Lord Jesus, we praise you for your victory on the cross. That you gave your life for us. That you were the acceptable sacrifice for the sins of the world. And through trusting in you, through submitting to your rule in our lives, your reign, through seeking and finding you by your grace, through faith as your spirit leads us and empowers us. Lord, we share in that same victory. And so Lord, we do proclaim your death until you return, knowing that you will return victorious and we will again share in that victory with you because our sins have been washed clean and we have been made righteous by you. So we thank you and praise you for that, Lord, as we drink together. Let's drink. Amen. As the worship team comes up here, they're going to lead us in one final song. And as they do, let's pray once more. Lord Jesus, we thank you. Father God, we praise you for your son. We praise you for your spirit. We thank you that he is here in our midst, leading us in to your truth. We pray, Lord, that like Mary, we would have faith, trusting in you, seeking you, obeying you, serving you and not our own selfish desires, not our own plans and agendas, but your agenda, Lord, your purposes, your way. I pray, Lord, that we would all keep our eyes fixed on you, Lord Jesus, this season, and that we would be filled with joy and excitement as we go through it, not just Father God, that you are faithful and sent your son as you said you would, but that he is coming again soon. And we can be excited at the ultimate victory that we will all share in when you return, Lord Jesus. Lord, help us to walk in joy this season, to walk in faith, and that you would be glorified, Lord, through it all. We pray these things. In Jesus' name, amen.
Your faith. 
magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on my humble estate, on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and his holy name, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Thank you, Jesus, that you did great things and you're doing great things, Lord God. Thank you that your blood is enough to bring us to you, Lord God, to reconcile our sinful way and bring us back to your throne, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus, that you did that. And thank you that you're doing great things in our midst, Lord God. I pray that you would be, you would let us be a part of them, Lord God. Lord God, help us to be like Mary submitting ourselves, being your humble servants, Lord God. Do great things in us, in our midst, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name. We're going to play that one more time. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You've never failed. Your promise still stands. Thank you for worshiping with us tonight. Let's go from here walking in faith, praising and blessing our faithful God. Amen? Amen. Be blessed, church.